Did you ever think in your wildest dreams that you'd be on 50 grand a week? 100% not. I wasn't thinking about the numbers. I was just thinking about the targets to hit, to reach the numbers, if you get me. So it wasn't like I was obsessed with, oh, if I do this, I'm going to have this amount of money. It was always the, the actual target set to achieve it. I've always said I wanted to play for England. I still have that dream now. I, I think for me, I have the mentality that everything's possible. Nothing's impossible. The individuals in there and the actual culture in that England squad. Yeah. Do you think we actually honestly got a proper chance of getting anywhere near being winners of the World Cup? 100%. Talent that we've got, the players we've got, the, the culture that they've created there. I get the predictions of a current footballer, Mr. Isaac Hayden, about this year's World Cup. He's currently signed to Newcastle Football Club, actually on loan to Norwich City. So of course we speak about these football clubs, we speak about training, mindset, determination, and his plans for the future. Subscribe, comment, be happy, never content, and thanks for listening. Right, welcome back to the podcast, the Stephen Sully Study. Um, I've interviewed a lot of athletes over, over my time, uh, footballers, boxers, rugby players, etc. And I've got another great one in front of me today. Isaac Hayden, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for this episode and it's going to be a good one. Yeah, no problem at all. Great to be on. So where shall I start? You're actually from Essex, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Give me give yeah. me your best impression of an Essex person or a lad. Oh, no. <laughs> I can't do that. Everyone, everyone who I meet, they never say, whenever I say I'm from Essex, they always say, oh, wow, like, no, you can't be, or... They always think, oh, why didn't you have the accent? Or it's either that or it's, you know, Towie, do you know anyone from there and the Sugar Heart back in the day? <laughs> so yeah, no, um, yeah, from Essex originally, Chomsford born, Brentwood living. Um, yeah, loved it. Um, See, when I think about people from Essex, obviously you've got the Ta Towie uh, programme, <laughs> yeah. which, which kind of sort of, um, corners a lot of people's minds when they think about Essex yeah. just because it's TV and social media but when I think of them I think they're good sales people they're good hustlers they're, yeah. they're, they're driven people they're people that in a respectful way don't give a fuck they just go off their dreams and their aspirations which I think is a really really good trait yeah. um, would you say the culture of living in Essex has helped you become an athlete and a premiership footballer um, I would say yeah because it's a difficult one because my parents, when I when I was growing up, they always tried to do the best for me anyway, but they always tried to protect me a little bit from, you know, bad areas or, you know, bad things like crime or anything like that. They always, always were important in terms of protecting me. Um, so compared to a lot of football players that you see or that you talk to, a lot of them grow up in poverty. Um, you know, football is the only thing they've got. Whereas I was, or well, not opposite, but I was completely different in that, you know, my upbringing was comfortable, you know, it wasn't, we weren't rich, but we weren't poor. Um, you know, I always got provided with what I needed, not what I wanted, but what I needed. Uh, was always safe. And I said Brentwood at the time, there was no crime there really. It was just, you know, um, a good, good, safe place to grow up. Um, I had the basics, I had a park down the road, I had, you know, friends from school. Uh, but I would say that, at the time that I was growing up, it was very, um, it, there wasn't very many ethnic minority people in the area. I think it was probably in my secondary school, probably, you know, two black kids in my year. Um, so it was very much that type of uh, upbringing where I didn't really have any sort of crime, any you know, drugs related issues with anywhere not close by. Um, it was very much a, not sheltered, but well, to be fair, it was a little bit sheltered upbringing. So that kind of helped me to, you know, stay off of any bad paths. Yeah. I mean, so how was that? I didn't, I didn't even really think about this as a conversation, but yeah. just cause you brought it up, you know, being one of the only black people in your, in your school, in your area, was yeah. that a good thing? Was that, did you experience maybe racism or, yeah. or people being disrespectful to you because of your, your, your race? Uh, how did you deal with that? Yeah, definitely. At times there was difficult moments, but I think that because of the, it was like a mentality that I had early on. I don't know. I can't tell you why it was there or what happened or was there a particular point, but I always had that mentality of, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to be. And it didn't matter what anyone else said or anyone was almost in the way. I was always going to achieve that because of what my mentality was. And I think that I was so focused on almost I wouldn't say uber focused but I was almost too focused on what I wanted to achieve that no matter what if it was you know comments or 
you know, I wasn't the most popular kid or whatever it was at school, whatever, it, you know, the only black child or one of the only black children in, in the area or in the school didn't bother me because all I was focused on was the end goal of what I wanted to achieve. And that was my motivation. That was all that I was interested in. And even I say now to my parents and other people that, that were in the school with me, you know, even when I was 14, 15, 16, there was no girls. I wasn't interested in girls really. Um, I wasn't interested in doing the, um, I don't know how to say it, the normal things that you would normally do as a kid. I mean, the amount of parties that I didn't go to, the amount of times when I didn't go up, you know, I think it's ice skating, bowling, prom. And I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't do these things. Cause I said, if I had a child, well, if I've got a daughter now, but if I had a son and he was going for the same things, I'd probably say to him, listen, you know, it's okay to do those things. But I was so uber focused that I wasn't interested in any of that. So I think the whole thing about the area, I don't think it really mattered because um, I was almost in my own bubble. So what I would say to that is you're super disciplined, but yeah. someone else listening to this might say, nah, Isaac, he's, he's boring. What would you say to that? 100%, yeah. This is, that's what I used to get a lot growing up. You know, I used to get that so many times. You know, even my mum and dad used to say, oh, come on, like you can, you know, you go to that party or, you know, it's a Friday night, why don't you go out with your friends? My mates used to say, oh, well, you never come out or you do this or even over the park, we used to have a massive party. There used to be kids from around the area that used to play um, five a side or whatever. But I used to say, no, no, it's all right. I'll, you know, do my own thing or I'd do my own drills and my dad would be there helping me out and, and doing certain things. But at the end of the day, you can say it's boring, but I just go, well, it's not boring now, is it? So, you know, you're, you're the ones doing what you don't want to do and I'm the one doing what I do want to do. So at the end of the day, the sacrifice um, was, was worth it. Definitely. Um, do you drink alcohol? No. Never? I have drink, no, I have drunk alcohol before, so it's not like I don't know what it, what it feels like or what it tastes like, but for me, I, I sampled it very young. And once I sampled it and I knew what it, what it was, um, once I turned 18, it was like, I'd done that. And it was like, I've, you know, it's not, it's not, con for me, it's not conducive to what I want to achieve and what I want to be. So unless it's adding something to what I want to achieve, then I think there's no real gain in me doing it. I know I'm speaking to an intelligent man and a disciplined man and someone who's a go-get and striver because you used the word sampled, whereas I would have <laughs> yeah. said, I tried alcohol when I was yeah. younger. This guy yeah. is like a professor. Yeah. Um, but anyway, all jokes aside, I think, I think the sacrifice, if you take something away and work really, really hard on something, eventually you're going to get to your goal and you're a product of that. Yeah. Let's start about, talk about the beginning then. Yeah. So... I know I've got here that you're playing at Southend, Southend yeah. United. Yeah. Uh, by 13 years of age, you left and you joined. You're a product of Arsenal's academy. Yeah. So being from Chelmsford, yeah. part of Arsenal's academy, but then now, you know, playing, you know, moving up to Hull and then Newcastle, Norwich, etc. Yeah. What's that culture shift like, you know, from being down south, now being up north? Oh, massive. It's, it's totally different. I mean... I will, to be honest, I touch on South End because that was a really, really important part of my journey. Um, you know, it was, it, to me, it was at the time I didn't think about it, but certainly now, you know, thinking, looking back and I've been back a few times to the club and, you know, some of the people that I had or I worked under were still there and stuff like that. But that was such an important foundation. I didn't realise until now how big a part it was, um, you know, because I turned up there when I was nine um, you know, I got scouted, you know, playing local football. Um, my dad and me didn't have a clue. You know, we were very naive when it came to academy football and things like that we didn't have a clue. I mean, yeah. I turned up and they were all in the kit and I was there in my, you know, all kit that's different and mishmash kit. And um, he was like, oh my God, he's like, wow, like, are you going to be all right? He was almost like worried to let me go and train because he was like, look at them all, they've like all got the same boots and this. I remember the, he saying to me the first session I went in and I just blitzed it and he was like, oh, he came off and he was like, oh, well, they're not even that good. <laughs> He's like, you you know, you're you're a good player and have some confidence. But um, South End, it's actually funny enough that the, a lot of the, the coaches that I had at the time have now gone on to do very good things. So, you know, I had a um, under 10s coach called Mark Bonner, who's now the manager of Cambridge United. Um, first team and then I had another coach called Luke Hobbs who um, left Southend and actually I think it's 10 years later moved to Arsenal now he's um, 
uh, head of development at Arsenal uh, Academy. So a lot of the people at South End at the time that I was there were of elite standard of coaching. Um, although South End wasn't a big club, I think they were in League One maybe at the time. Um, I had a really good foundation from under nines to under thirteens, um, and then under thirteens said Arsenal speaks for itself. The players that it's produced, the standard of coaching, and the the, the top players that you're around at your age group was a great upbringing, um, fantastic coaches. Uh, Steve Leonard, um, sort of under 14s to 16s was a top coach. We had Steve Bold, Neil Bamfield, who's now at QPR. We had really, really good, solid people, not just coaches, but solid people that um, put morals into you. Um, it wasn't just all about the football, it was about making you a better person. Um, so that if you didn't make it or you didn't quite make the Arsenal grey, which I didn't, um, that you could have a career somewhere else and that you were put in good stead. Um, but then, yeah, as you said, the North-South divide, um, it's a big thing because when you've been, as I said, in the South and you've, don't get me wrong, I've been to other places to play other clubs, but you only play, you only go there to play. You know, you don't see the surroundings, you don't take the time, you just literally go in there to play. So when I moved to Hull, it was a it was a big uh, a big wake up and a big shock because um, you know Hull was totally different to live. I mean, it's okay visiting somewhere for a day or so, but when you live there, you really get to sample what it's like. And uh, I think that was the first time that I'd really not moved away from home because I'd been living away from home um, the year before anyway. But certainly away from what I was used to, my friends and you know, teammates and stuff um, was a was a big eye opener. Um, and then I actually said to myself when we uh, we got promoted at Hull and I came back to Arsenal, I remember saying, oh, you know, I'm, oh, I'm going to find a club that's, that's closer to home. I was like, yeah, no, I've, I've sampled it now. I've done it and I want, I want to be back home. And, uh, and then I signed for Newcastle. <laughs> so it couldn't have been any further away. Yeah, the rest is history, as yeah. they say. Okay, so... As far as your football ability is concerned, we're going to talk about your clubs, obviously yeah. what you want to do next, you know, in the future. You're still yeah. a young man, you know, stuff outside of football. But as far as your football ability is concerned, would you say you're manufactured on earth or made in heaven? I'd say that you, you'd have to be made in heaven slightly, just purely because I think that a lot of players have natural ability. Um, I've seen so many, I'm not saying that I'm fully made in heaven because I don't think that, that anyone can be, maybe Messi, Lionel Messi, but in general, I think that you've got to have talent in the first place because not anyone can just play football. You have to have some sort of natural ability and, and talent to, to be able to progress and work on it. But I'd say it's 80% manufactured um, because the amount of players that I've seen, I've played with, I've spoke, I even speak to now from the past, or I see, you know, pop up on Instagram or social media, whatever it is, is I was probably the one player. If you asked, if you got everyone in a room, that was, I'd probably go back to under 16s. Everyone in the room and said, who was the most likely to make it out of everyone? I don't think I'd be in the top five. So it was like, I was never really the one, the superstar, up and coming, rising kid that everyone talked about. I was always the one who was just steady Eddie. Um, and I feel like that almost helped me to become mentally stronger, have the motivation still to obviously kick on. So I never got given anything. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'd say definitely for me, I was 80% manufactured because as I said, talent wise, I don't think I was better or the best in, in my year group. Yeah, so, okay, manufactured predominantly then, yeah. what does manufactured on earth actually mean to you? I think to me, it's actually working on your craft and actually having a, a real dedication and like you said before, discipline in order to strive to become better. And, um, you know, there's a saying that we have, um, that I spoke to a couple of people about in high performance is relentless pursuit of better. Um, and that's something that Newcastle uh, now uses a motto and it's something that I've always used as a motto for a few years. Um, and it's just about relentlessly striving to be as best as you can be in whatever craft that is. And um, I'm a firm believer that 
you can't be the best at everything. You're never going to be the best at everything. But if you've got a certain craft, it doesn't have to be football. It could be anything. And you give 110% effort into that craft, you will improve at it. It's, it's simple. The, the mathematics are easy, but you have to dedicate everything to that craft. Otherwise, it's you can't do it half-hearted. You won't improve. Um, so look, 11th of July 2016, you signed a five-year contract with Newcastle. Yeah. Um, definitely want to talk to you a bit more about Newcastle, where they are right now, as opposed yeah. to where they were when you signed that contract. Because yeah. in my mind, yeah. they're you know completely you know not I'm not going to say a completely different club, but it's the more juggernaut version of Newcastle now because but, of all the funding, the culture, etc. And I want to get a real first hand snip it from you what that is like i'm going to ask you something that's kind of personal but it's, it's coming from a good place yeah i like to look at people's net worths yeah yeah because i'm a business person and i'm relatively young in the business world 36 years of age yeah even though i look younger i know <laughs> um and what motivates me is not just money but like you know <clears throat> how many properties someone's got you know uh what they're doing charity wise you know how fit they are how strong they are i, I like to look at a whole profile and think you know what they're better than me in these areas i want to try and get there yeah. not in a malicious way just in a no, motivational course, yeah. way and <clears throat> Being from Chelmsford, going right back to the humble beginnings, you wasn't necessarily poor, you wasn't no. necessarily rich, you were just, you know, just, just a normal middle class family, right? Yep. I know Chelmsford really well, it's actually a really nice part of the world. I used to actually date a bird around there, <laughs> who's, who's, who, <laughs> whose dad was absolutely Keiko. Oh, but anyway, really? nice. another story. And he was actually one of the first people I saw real money. So yep. <clears throat> this idol net worth said on the internet that you're worth... 12 million dollars according to them and yeah. you actually had a have an annual sal uh, a weekly salary of fifty thousand a week now i'm not asking you to pin yourself down at how accurate that is but <laughs> it must be in and around that yeah yeah it's fairly accurate yeah yeah, yeah. now you're 25 27 27 okay yeah. my math is terrible um 27 years of age now thinking back to when you was a kid yeah I know your first passion is the football and becoming the best version of yourself. And I, I truly believe when you say that, I believe it. Yeah. But the byproduct of it, earning this money, how does that make you feel? And did you ever think in your wildest dreams that you'd be on 50 grand a week? 100% not. Anywhere, anywhere near that sort of money or anywhere near those figures quoted. Um, as I said, I'll bring it back. My my dad was a was a massive part of my football career, my journey to start with, um, and it we never even thought of it, being honest. We didn't even thought of being a professional football player. It was only until I turned fifteen, sixteen, and they were talking about scholarships and you know you get paid. I think it was five hundred a month to start with, and then you go on to your first pro contract. That was the only time when I thought wow, I've got a real chance of actually doing this as a job. Before that, when I was 9, 10, 11, 12, I was, you know, I was a big golfer. Um, I used to play golf all summer, um, probably golf almost more than football at one stage when I was 12, 13. Um, I used to skateboard, believe it or not. I was a massive skateboarder. I used to love watching um, skateboard videos and I was even thinking of going to the US to do some skateboarding stuff so I, it wasn't necessarily that I've always thought I was going to be a professional football player um, like I said when I got to 15, 16 that was you know when I thought now my dad will vouch for this so when I was I think when I was 16 he said to me he said he used to clean my boots all the time by the way he, ever since I was nine he said listen he said in, if in football you get to 25,000 a week, he's like, I want 5% of your weekly wage for cleaning your boots all the way until you were 18. And I was like, yeah, dad. I was like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And he made that deal, you know, in his head, he was thinking there's no chance. He was like, no, no, no. And even I was sitting there thinking, I was like, I'll take that deal because I was thinking, Pff. and then it was only when I was, you know, 20, 21 and I was there and I was getting closer and closer and it was pretty much there. And I was like, wow. And I was looking at the contract that I signed, I was thinking, I've got a real, you know, if it was incentivized, the Newcastle first contract, and I was thinking, wow, I've got a real chance here to actually surpass that um, and see where I can get. And then it was almost like, I wasn't thinking about the numbers. I was just thinking about the targets to hit, to reach the numbers, if you get me. So it wasn't like I was obsessed with, oh, you know, if I do this, I'm gonna have this amount of money. It was always the, 
the actual target set to achieve it. And then once I achieved it, it was like, oh great, like, you know, it was a almost a prop byproduct where I had extra capital to be able to invest or to do what I wanted with it. But it was always in my head, oh, where's the next level? Where's the next level? Can I get to the next target? And then that was the way that I used myself to motivate in order to get the more money. You know, it wasn't necessarily the money was the first thing. It was the target to get the money. So whether that was 50 Premier League games, 100 Premier League, whatever it was, mm. it was always that football always came first to me. And then the yeah. money then followed the football. And that's what my dad used to say to me. He'd say, listen, you concentrate on the football and you do well. You play lots of games. You do well in the Premier League. The money will come. It's just part of the product of what you do. So, yeah. Did you stick to the 5% to your dad? I didn't know. He wouldn't take a penny off me. Uh, believe it or not, my parents, uh, this is this is different, you know, everyone's different, but, um, you know, a lot of people talk about getting their parents out of poverty or getting them a new house or getting them whatever. Um, my parents, my dad was fortunate enough that he worked hard himself in insurance for a lot of years um, and he never asked a penny off me, um, you know. Yes, okay, there might be little things that he might say, oh, for birthday, for Christmas, or, you know, son, do you mind getting me that? That's, you know, mini, tiny things, but he never asked for a penny. Um, and to their credit, to his credit especially, he never used my football as a way of, you know, oh, because, I mean, even we still talk about it now. Some kids, you know, 13, 14, 15, their dad's on the side and will be like, oh, you know, my son's doing really well. He's my pension and you know, all these things. And he never put that pressure on me. It was never about the money for him. He just wanted to see me do the best that I could do and get to the highest level that, that I could. So as I said, when he comes to watch me now and when he came to watch me at Newcastle, it was always like, he was just happy that I was at that level. It wasn't that, oh, I could go and buy him a car now or, you know, I could upgrade his house. Cause he was like, well, I'm happy with my house. It's paid off. I've done that. Didn't need you to do that. And they're happy with what they've got. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a bit, different for me obviously some people have motivations for money which I completely get because of the circumstances that they're in but I was just fortunate that I didn't have that um, circumstance on me and I, I have to be grateful to them because mm. of what they did and the hard work that my dad did in order to put himself and, his, and my mum in that position that I didn't need to be yeah. sort of paying them but yeah. I, I offered it to him don't get me wrong I said listen dad it's here 10% no problem he went um, sounds to me like your dad was is very proud of you, but equally on the flip side, it sounds like you're very proud of your dad, which yeah, is hundred percent great thing to see. Hundred percent because you know we we put in the hard yards, we put in the hard work. You know, I think there's just I talked about it before, but you know we didn't. I didn't join a Sunday league team for a year. I mean, I was eight. We he trained me himself um, two, three times a week for a year, but just just purely him, he got cones, he looked at drills on the internet. Um, you know, we did all these things together. Um, and don't get me wrong, there was times when I didn't like him. You know, he used to say, right, we're not leaving until you've done, you know, 15 reps of this or whatever. And I used to get to 14 and he used to be like, right, no, do it again. But it was all those little training things that built me up to be able to then go to academy football and it'd be easy, you know, so. I've got a lot to thank him for. And if it, I don't think if it was for him, then I probably would have the career that I have, yeah. have today. I've got to say, I think every single footballer I've inter uh, interviewed so far have all been pretty much, you know, grounded, business, you know, focused, etc. And you, you also come across like that. Yeah. But again, let's like, when I started working for a sales company, I was like 19, 20 years of age. Yeah. <clears throat> And it was, you know, you was commission and you were uncapped how much you could earn. I mean, there were people earning like a hundred grand, yeah. you know, a month um, <laughs> as, as a young man, as a salesperson. Yeah. And it was mind blowing to me because I'm from a very similar background to yourself in regards to, I'm not from Essex, but I'm from, uh, you know, middle class. Yep. My mum and dad did split up. There was a lot of like, you know, bad times there. And I used to see my dad kind of struggling a bit to try and, give me and my brother and my mum money but you know whilst my mum was living a different life it was all a bit mad so when I had the opportunity of starting to earn some money I went I really went for it yeah and the first time I earned five grand in a month then 10 grand in a month and then it stepped up to like 20 25 you can't I couldn't help but to think oh what like what should I start doing with it and yeah. 
you start buying a Porsche, Turbo, Lamborghini, <laughs> yeah. Ferrari, 458, and then yeah. before you know it, you're like, you're just trying to outdo yourself every time with of a course. different car, different watch. Yeah. It's only when you get around, not rich people, but wealthy people, yes. you start learning there's a big difference. Yeah. And the actual fact, wealthy people, a lot of the time, they go in the opposite. It's like they're trying to yeah. spend a lot of time giving away their money or not looking wealthy yeah. or rich. Yeah. So it's a really kind of good sort of transition I've gone through over the years and understood the difference between getting money, making more money, getting yeah. that money working hard back for you and the difference yeah. between rich and wealthy, etc. So anyway, I want to ask you, when you started earning, you know, some serious money at the start, yeah. was there any trappings that you found yourself going down, like buying the cars and watches all that kind um, of stuff? No, because, uh, well, actually, I tell a lie, I, you start to understand what money is when you, I mean, as I said, when I signed the contract at Newcastle, that was probably the first, I'd say before that, the money that I was getting wasn't, it was an academy contract. So it wasn't, you know, what you would call big money in the football world. But I think once I signed that first contract at Newcastle, the five year one, and I had that, you know, the whole sort of template of the contracts in front of me, and I knew what the overall potential was of the earnings for that contract and obviously once you sign that contract that's a contract at the end of the day um so you sit there and think right i can plan for this amount of time and for for these certain things you sit there and think wow like it's a lot of money because it was a big jump for me because that was my first what i'd call proper contracts i'd had two pro contracts before but they were like you know academy ones where you're trying to break into the first team so they're no it's nowhere near mm -hmm. what newcastle was at the time where i was actually going there to be a first team player so it was a first team contract um and yeah of course when you first get that sum of money and the, the first wage hits your bank account you're like Phew. you're like i've never seen so much at one time before and of course you have to as part of growing up especially as a young kid you have to understand you have to go through certain things you know in terms of you know, you go out and you go to a nightclub with your mates or whatever it is at 21, you've got a bill and it's like five grand and you think, you don't you don't bat an eyelid, you know? You just think, oh, but you know, whatever the minimum spend is, oh, it's five grand tonight. Right, yeah, just pay that and we'll get this bottle, that bottle. And you think, oh, at 21, you think, yeah, like you don't think about it. It's only when you, as you say, you grow old and you think, wow, like, you know, that's a lot of money to general people, you know, especially nowadays it's, you know, money's money's very you know it's very sparse around the world and especially for for people that are, that are struggling so you always have that in the back of your mind but i always feel like i learned very quickly uh, i wouldn't say there was like a moment where i got stung where i you know i gambled it or i said i don't gamble so i don't gamble i said i i, I stopped drinking or i didn't really drink you know past 21 22 because i didn't I, I worked out this isn't going to be where I want to achieve what I want to achieve and do the best that I can do. So there's no point in me doing it. So it wasn't gambling, wasn't drinking. So in terms of vices that a lot of young kids that are professional footballers would get trapped in, I wasn't trapped in. Um, and then the other one, the only thing you could say is, is babies and girls and stuff. But again, I wasn't trapped in that because I had my missus from 21. Um, we had a daughter. Um, so like I was already settled in that way. Mm. So it wasn't like I was gonna get distracted and I was doing all this and that. So um, as I said, for me, it was just about learning quite early and quickly um, and then making sure that I had the right financial advice in order to properly invest the money that, that I had. Okay. I've got to be honest, when I was typing your name in the internet and uh, I'm giving away some of my strategy when I look at my, my guests, yeah. I will type in things like their name and obviously yeah. look at all the good stuff and then I'll type in like crime yeah. or I'll type in this <laughs> or that just to see if any articles come up because yeah, yeah. I want to make the podcast a bit sort of juicy sometimes. Juicy, yeah, of course. You're squeaky clean, mate. Like there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing, nothing, nothing bad about you that comes up, which is, yeah. which is great. The reason why I say this, I'm not saying it's a given, like every yeah. athlete, every footballer, every high paid icon in the world does nutty stuff. But yeah. let's be honest, Conor McGregor, yeah. argue, arguably, <laughs> you know, you could say he's an yeah. MMA fighter, so he should be a bit crazy. Yeah. But, you know, he's obviously done some, some mental stuff. He's a great fighter. Floyd Mayweather, I mean, the list, yeah, the, yeah. This, is, this is in this. Can money, a lot of money to a young, predominantly men, 
yeah. high profiled individuals who are playing for the premiership or who are high profile boxers UFC fighters can it really damage their career long term massively yeah because I mean they said it's squeaky clean online yeah I, I've certainly made mistakes um, I'm big enough and happy enough to sit here you know I mean we had a really difficult time with with my daughter um, and, and my missus at the time we had a really, really difficult time with her birth um, we actually separated for a little while um, probably I said my daughter probably would have only been four or five months old and you know we separated for a little while the stress of it the the actual almost realism of the situation probably hit me and I was I said I was only 22 so I was quite immature when you think about having a child um, and as I said we yeah we split up for a little while um, you know but luckily for us it was only a short short amount of time a few months and then we got back together reconciled and obviously have been stronger ever since but as I said I've had experiences myself where you know at 22 21 I've made errors you know I've gone all right I'm going to go here or I'm going to do that and I'm going to spend this money on this and you know what I would say is normal actions for 21 year olds like if I was a 21 year old um I don't know and I worked in a pub for example or I was a 21 year old uni student like what I would do wouldn't be a problem but when you're a 21 year old football player who's playing or 22 and he's playing in the Premier League and you you have that almost not exposure but you have a certain way to behave or what people would think should behave like you do sometimes have moments where you think oh do you know what? I just wish I could just go and do that and no one would care what I did or no one would say oh you know so and so was there or Hayden was there or whatever it is but yeah I said I've made mistakes in the past luckily for me I've we've you know I've managed to salvage mistakes that I've made but um, I would say especially at 21 22 23 when I mean, you do have large sums of money if you're not if you haven't got the right people around you said my family was very good in terms of advice for me um and getting me through especially my my missus in terms of certain things um you know you can go off the rails very very easily yeah. um but i was just fortunate said because i had the right people around me to to guide me through so uh devil's uh, no, I'll throw a curveball in there. That's probably yeah. a better expression. Touch wood, this never happens, but I'm yeah. going to ask you, you break your leg tomorrow, you'll yeah. never be able to play again. Yeah. How do you survive? How do you? How does your family survive? Well, I funny you should say that, actually, because I said I've had, a, I've had a lot of injuries over the last 18 months, so I've always had that thought in the back of my mind. The main thing for me, there's, there's two, is obviously the money that I've already already invested in, in numerous things. The main thing is the family home. Now, as I said, I, we're currently doing renovations at the minute. Um, it's probably, I think it's got 18 months left in the mortgage. So it was quite a quite a substantial mortgage. There's not that long left. I have medical insurance. So anything that goes wrong, like you said, I'm covered for the length of my contract and for a certain amount of money that I've set as what I would be happy to receive if I couldn't play football again. Um, and then it's just as I said, it's just making sure that you're switched on and that you've got a plan afterwards. Because I said, after football's finished, I don't want to finish with football. Um, I would say that I'm an obsessive football guy. Um, so if I'm not playing, I'm watching. If I'm not watching, I'm learning. So, you know, I've got a whole dossier at home of every manager that I've worked for, um, their strengths, their weaknesses, what I've learned session plans, everything. Um, cultures at clubs, whether that was Arsenal, Newcastle, Hull, uh, Norwich now, I write it all down so that at the end of my career, I said, I, I wanna be a sporting director, a technical director at a football club, because I feel like I can add value. Uh, and I've seen firsthand what, um, you know, what a good run, what, what a good running a football club is or an organization. Um, so I've structured everything so that, you know, come the end of my career, um, I should be in a good position to add value to a football yeah. club in whatever capacity that is, whether it's recruitment, whether it's academy, whether it's first team, whatever it is. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, that's what I'd do. Part of your, uh, your, your plan, which we'll talk about afterwards, is your investment into the Richard Hamilton artwork. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. Um, 
going back to being a footballer and sometimes you know if you were working at a pub if you was in yeah. insurance if you was a i don't know recruiter you probably wouldn't be scrutinized as much no. as you are as a high profile individual especially being a footballer actually the 14th of March 2022, a £19,000 fine by the Football <laughs> <Yeah>. Association. <laughs> I sound like an interrogator, yeah. don't I? <laughs> Please. <laughs> uh, was this you? No, um, after a tweet yeah. about a referee called David Coots. Yeah. Um, I did, I, I've purposely not read more about it because I want to get first-hand, uh, <laughs> first-hand information. Was you there at the scene in the crime? <laughs> no, I definitely um, did the what, crime. What, what actually, what actually happened, and do you think that was fair getting a nineteen thousand pound fine? Yeah. So, as I said, whenever I play for a football club, um, as I said, whether that's on loan, whether that's playing, you know, Newcastle, Norwich. Now I'm on, I'm on loan at. I'm one hundred and ten percent invested in that football club and in that team. You know, and and if if I feel a certain way about something, it, I'll always back the team, I'll always back my teammates, I'll always back the manager and back the club, you know, that's that's who I am as a person and that's what my passion is. Um, and as I said, at the time we played, I remember it, I, I was injured at the time, I, I was recovering from a MCL uh, reconstruction. So I wasn't actually playing in the game or actually in the squad, but I remember watching the game and I was thinking, come on, I was thinking we played really well, um, we deserved more out of the game. I think it was a one nil, if I believe it was a one nil loss. I think Kai Havertz scored, um, and it was Stonewall penalty. Um, like I don't know how VAR can't give it. I don't know how the referee couldn't give it. Everyone could see it, but the referee. So anyway, I've tweeted something like, um, you know, like the lads did really well, and it's hard to play when you're against twelve men. So obviously, I've said twelve men. And in my head, I'm sitting there thinking, well, they can't find me because I'm saying 12 men. So 12 men could mean anything. It could mean their fans. It could mean whatever. But the FA being the FA, the tweet got a lot of um, traction traction quite quickly. And because obviously Chelsea fans, they were getting on it. Obviously, and Chelsea's got quite a big following. Newcastle has said, New, yeah, Newcastle got a big following. So I think those two fan bases together and the, the managers of both clubs gave it a lot of traction. And then obviously FA picked up on it. They, they said, reading between the lines, they probably knew what I meant, um, but there was no real evidence of that. So anyway, I get, you know, get to training, uh, manager pulls me in his office and he goes, um, he goes, yeah, about this, this tweet, the FA are gonna do something. I was like, oh, I was like, all right. And he's like, oh, see what, see what they say and you know, go from there. And he was like, oh, by the way, like." Love the tweet. And I was like, oh, cheers, cheers, Gaffer. Yeah. Wasn't expecting him to say that, but he was, Eddie Howe as a manager is a very, very, very good man manager, very, very good operator. Um, and they said, I, I didn't work under him for a long period of time, but I loved my time working under him. Um, and I said, I'm so glad that, that him and the team are doing really well now. But, um, but yeah, so then, you know, a couple of days went by, a week went by, I thought, oh, they're just leaving it. And then, yeah, this got a tweet, my tweet, Twitter notifications are going off and it pinged up, oh, Hayden getting, you know, breach of FA rule, blah, 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 blah. And then it goes to a judge or a panel. And I was thinking, oh, I was thinking, oh, this is a load of rubbish over a tweet. Anyway, it comes back, yeah, 19,000. I was like, what? You can imagine all the lads of stranger were like, oh my God, 19,000 pounds, like, that's like, a, you know, like what, all of that for a tweet. But um, to be fair, uh, the club actually paid, so I didn't pay. So sorry, FA. But yeah, I didn't actually pay that one. The, um, that is actually crazy, because um, to say 12 men, obviously it's very clever tongue in cheek kind of stuff. Yeah. But like- It's a bit of banter. I could really. say, I could say, yeah, I, yeah. I could say if, if, if it was, yeah, we're against that club as well yeah. as a referee, I get that, because you're actually calling out, but- yeah. I, I didn't mean, call anybody out. It was a very, it, it, that's what I said. That's why I did the tweet. Cause I thought, well, yeah. you can't really pin that on me. But then they were saying, well, the club were like, just accept it. Because if you don't accept it and you go to court and then you get the FA court or whatever it is, and then you get fine, found guilty, then they can increase the fine or they can put match bans. So I was like, oh, do you know what? I was recovering from injury anyway. I was thinking, I can't be bothered to go through all that, get a lawyer, solicitor, barrister, all this nonsense. I was thinking, just accept it. And then to be fair, luckily the the club um, actually 
I think the new owners actually just dealt with it. So I was like, oh, thanks very much. It's crazy how um, something can take, be taken out of context of as well and, and, and blown up for just some, something as, 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 as minor as that. What is your relationship with social media then? Uh, like, do you think it's a good thing? Do you think it's something that can hinder players? Uh, definitely can hinder players if you haven't got the right mentality. Um, I mean, it can be used in a powerful way, um, but it can also be used as a tool to almost bash or, or abuse people with, which is the uglier side of it. Um, but there's certainly a side of it that is positive. I mean, even the thing like the, the Drac Grealish um, thing from yesterday, um, obviously a celebration for for the little boy Finley that he met. Um, you know, that those sorts of things, you know, bring magic to a little boy and give him the, exp give the, the you know, the exposure to that, um, that, that area and that scenario is just perfect. You know, that's what people want and that's what people want to see. Um, nice things like that. But social media on the other hand can then be, you know, things like the Harry Maguire situation where he's, it doesn't matter what he does, he could sneeze and it's wrong, you know? Um, so I definitely see it in both sides. I kind of like to keep mine football based. I tend not to put my private life on it just purely because um, I feel like social media opens up to you know the trolling the you know mm. the, the it's quite intense and I feel like if you're not uh, if you open up your family to that I feel like it's a lot more difficult um, whereas if it's just purely about football I don't mind someone telling me that I'm crap or you know I've had mess loads of messages you know or, you know you know you're shit or whatever it is but you, the worst thing in the world is you don't want people to bring your family in or start messaging your missus on there saying, oh, your husband's this or that, or, you know, talking about your kids or they've got pictures of you, you know. So everyone's different with how they see things. But for me, I, I just try to keep it strictly football mm. and keep them separate. On that note, like fans, stalkers, trolls, nutters, whatever yeah. you want to call them, they do find a way to try and find <laughs> yeah. things that are going to irritate you yeah. and get under your skin. And yeah. they will dig and they will actually find stuff that you didn't even know was out there. Yeah. You know, uh, photos with you and your family, etc. Yeah. Sort of things you've been exposed to, like social media abuse, what type of things have you come across? What about everything? I mean, to be honest, we've had, I've had, hope you die of cancer. Um, hope you die in a car crash. Um, I've uh, well, I've had I've had all sorts like horrific stuff. I mean, I wouldn't say I said Newcastle fans when there was a time when I was 2018. I was sent off at Cardiff, um, and at the time I, I wanted to leave the football club, um, and I won't go into the reasons why. I know the still backstop a bit, but anyway, I I got sent off, and I think a lot of fans thought I did it on purpose, and I got a lot of stick for that but it was never stick that was too far. But it seems to be like when you play against other teams or, you know, it's it's, it's usually people not from this country that are sending you this type of stuff that, that's like, you know, hope you die of cancer or it could be other teams, fans or trolls. I mean, you click on their profile, they've got like no, no followings and like, or oh, sorry, no followers and like 300 following and, you know, just weird, you know, weird in individuals that just don't have, obviously clearly don't have a lot to do in their lives. So they feel like they have to do that. Mm. So I said, I've had all sorts of things like that, but they don't, that doesn't bother me because it's, you know, as I said, it's someone who's very, very, um, you know, challenged, I think, mm. uh, to be saying those sorts of things and to be doing it, especially to somebody that you don't know and that's someone that you're not interested in. I find very strange, but um, yeah, as I said, I think there's pros and cons with social media, um, mm. but I definitely think it can be a good thing. Yeah. Right, let's talk about uh, Newcastle then, okay? Yeah. So when you sign to where they are now, I mean, I think, was it about a year ago? Then they had... Yeah, new, it was just, new, just over a year ago, yeah, October, yeah, middle new, of October. New backers yeah. uh, from the Middle East. Yeah, so it's... Jamie Rubin and the Rubin, well, the Rubin brothers, I think they own 10% or similar amount. And then Amanda Stavely and, and her husband Murdad, um, they own 10%. And then I think the PCP, well, not the PCP, the, um, well, it might be PCP Capital, there was an in, uh, investment fund from Saudi Arabia, um, own 80%. So does it, it puts them now 
the richest club in the Premiership, but also pretty much in the world. I think it's the richest club in the world, yeah. I think that they've got, I, I wouldn't want to quote figures in case they're wrong, but I'm, you know, billions and billions, almost an endless fund. However, it's said in football, it's difficult to get around that because you've got financial fair play. So it's not a case of, right, we've got the richest owners in the world, that's fine. But you can't just go and spend 500 million every transfer window because it's not sustainable. And it's, well, it is sustainable to them because they've got enough money, but it's not, doesn't reach financial fair play. Yeah. As a current footballer who signed to them, then yeah. how does, what's the emotion? How does it make you feel like with these people behind the club now? I think for me, when it happened, um, you know, I, I think I made a tweet at the time as well. I mean, I got loads of traction on it and I got loads of, oh, you're going to be sold in January and you're going to get, you know, this is your end of the club. Enjoy it. Enjoy the next game because after that you'll be shipped off and all this stuff. But genuinely from the bottom of my heart, you know, when I'd signed for Newcastle, I was, I'm very much somebody who signs for a purpose. I don't just, I wouldn't just sign somewhere for not a purpose, you know. I signed at Norwich now on loan because it was an opportunity to get me back playing and I saw the way the club was um, and the way that it was set up. And I genuinely believed that I could impact the club in a positive way in order to get promoted and to have a third promotion. That was the aim of me signing. And it's the same at Newcastle. Newcastle was, I felt was a sleeping giant at the time. It was a huge football club. It was a club that I'd witnessed growing up. I mean, li even little things like it was a f the first ever game I watched on Sky Sports. Um, my nan and granddad had Sky Sports before us. We couldn't afford it at the time, but they luckily got Sky Sports and I watched a Newcastle versus Man United game on Sky uh, and it was at St. James's Park. So that was the first game that I actually watched on a TV uh, was a Newcastle game. And then obviously the film Goal came out and I was really into goal and that was obviously based upon Newcastle. So I had little, you know, as I was growing up, little hints and little ideas about Newcastle. So then when I got the opportunity to sign there and have to be able to work under Rafa Benitez, who was, as I said, is a top elite level manager. Um, and obviously the, the club itself and being in the championship, I'd obviously just got promoted from Hull, or sorry, with Hull from the championship. So had that experience. I was thinking, well, I can add real value here. Uh, and then once I've got promoted, I've got a shot of actually playing in the Premier League because I'd never played in the Premier League before Newcastle. I'd been on the bench at Arsenal, but I'd never actually got on the pitch. So I was thinking, right, this is a real opportunity for me to do so. So to see where the club was when I joined to then that point where five years later, it was, you know, getting taken over with that wealth and that you know, ambition to be better. Mm. I was just wholeheartedly happy for the fans and for the club itself. And not just the fans, but the people that work there, because there's so many people that work behind the scenes in any football club that yeah. don't get recognition, that, you know, want the best for the football club and that have been there, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. So you're just really happy for those people because at the end of the day, we're players, we're contracted to play at a certain club, but we're going to be gone, you know, you know, two, three, four, five years, you know, we've, however long we stay at a club for and move on to the next club or, you know, if we retire. Whereas these people have been there 20, 30, 40 years, they've, they're the heart and soul of the club. So I was just genuinely happy for those people and for the fans because the fans have been wanting it for years and years to be better than where we were. And, you know, not instantly, they would never want to click of the finger, but they wanted to have the ambition to be better and to actually want to be better the owners wanted the club to be better not just happy to be you know average mm. um and i was just happy for them so yeah mm. that for me it was a massive massive turning point in the club's uh, history i remember when abramovich this is showing my age but <laughs> came in to the club and uh they were nicknaming chelsea chelsky and stuff yes. like that because of the 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 russian tire yeah. etc and the reality was a billionaire coming into the club at that point, into Massive. the Premier League at that point, yeah. it basically meant if you bought right, you were going to win the league. And after a while, that definitely did happen. They had yeah. obviously Jose Mourinho came in uh, to, to manage the club. They got yeah. some wicked players. Did yeah. they drop <laughs> bar? bar yeah. I mean, so many elite players. Uh, and it was a really, really good, good time. Now, though, there are a lot more football clubs that have a lot more money. But yeah. obviously, Newcastle is, is the richest do you yeah. think all that money basically means eventually you will win the premiership? Um, hmm. It's a hard one. 
now, as, as I said, because yes, we're the richest club in the world and it's got <clears throat> endless pits of money. However, there's a big question mark in that in terms of financial fair play. Now, there's only a certain amount of money that you can use of that wealth every year or every transfer window, if you want to call it that, and infrastructures to improve the club. Now, for me, looking at it from everything that we've talked about and everything that the club's talked about, you've got to put four, five, six years before winning a Premier League for me. I mean, don't get me wrong, you could do a Leicester, they could do a Leicester this year or next year or whatever, but to sustainably be there and contend, it's well known, Liverpool, Manchester City, what is it, a billion pounds on the squad over the last mm. six, seven years. So the squad transformation needs to obviously take place, better players. Although I must say the squad now at Newcastle is very, very good. Um, got a lot of very good players, a lot of players that have improved under the new manager. Um, but, you know, talking about history, um, you know, that's historically what it takes. You know, Manchester City now are dominant, you know, always at the top of the league the last two, three, four years. And the reason being so is because they incrementally increase the, 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 the better players into the squad, better infrastructure, you know, the training f facilities at City are arguably the best in the country. The, you know, the, the things like the nutritionist, the chef, the physios, the doc, everything is of the highest, highest level. And that takes time. You can't just rock up to a club and just go, right, I'm going to bring in the best of this, the best of that, because it's impossible. So you have to slowly, incrementally build a football club. And I said, it wasn't in a bad position anyway, because I think we finished, you know, mid table, 12th, 11th, you know, for the three or four years I think it was between 11th and 13th so we've been almost consistent but to bridge that gap from 11th to winning the league is is a big gap to bridge so for me I think it'll take four or five years at least okay good political answer that right uh you you like I said you're squeaky clean so I'm trying to find angles where I can irritate you a little bit and I <laughs> think I might have found one right <clears throat> mother's English that's Jamaican okay yeah today Jamaica and the England squad approach you. Yeah. And they come together and they both <laughs> offer you yeah. an amazing opportunity to play for the country. Yes. Who are you choosing? England. So that's funny, funny enough, it's a good question because Jamaica did approach me. They've mm -hmm. approached me for two years. So I said that it was, uh, yeah, two years ago that they, they spoke to me um, and wanted me to obviously get a Jamaican passport and play for Jamaica. Uh, and I said, I'll say the same thing now as what I said to them when um, they asked me is that they, whether, you know, people want to accept it or not, is that I've always said I wanted to play for England. I still have that dream now. I, I think for me, I have the mentality that everything's possible. Nothing's impossible, uh, you know, until I've retired and, I, you know, my legs can't move or whatever it is, I still think I've got a chance. So in my head, even though I'm at the moment, I'm miles away from playing for England, in my head, I still believe that I've got a chance because I have the firm ability that, or firm mentality that and nothing's impossible. So I, that's what I said to them. I said, they were like, no, you're not going to play for England because of X, Y, and Z and come and play for Jamaica. We're going to go to the World Cup. This was what the pitch was. You know, we've got loads of players joining now. I think there was Ravel Morrison, there was Daniel Johnson, who's played with Preston, there was um, Antonio from West Ham. So there's a few players that were going there to then try and help them get to the World Cup. But I said, listen, if I'm in your team to try and get to the World Cup, that's what my motivation is to play for Jamaica, to get to the World Cup, to play in the World Cup. That's not what my motivation is to do. My motivation is to go there because I want to go. That's who I want to play for, not just to play in the World Cup. Because in my head, they're wanting me to get to the World Cup. I can say I've played in the World Cup. Then after that, done. Like, you know, I wouldn't play for them again. I can't be bothered now to fly every international break to Jamaica. And then I'd be taken out of position from somebody who's desperate to play for Jamaica. Almost similar position to me. I want to play for England. Someone else in Jamaica who's given an opportunity to play for their country that's desperate to play for their country. Yeah, I'm taking it up because... I want to play at a world or potentially play at a world cup when I'm not really interested in playing for Jamaica. Mm. So I said, I don't want to be that guy. I said, I'd rather put all my eggs in one basket 
and do everything I possibly can. Even if I don't make it, I don't play for England. At least I can say, listen, I did everything that I could do to play for England. I stuck to my morals in terms of that situation and that's what I wanted to do and that's it. And I didn't take up a position to play five or six or 10 games with Jamaica to get to a World Cup and then say, oh, I've played in the World Cup now and can't bother anymore. Yeah. So that was my, yeah, that's what I told them. And I think they just went, oh, okay. And then that was it. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I saw here that you played for under 16s, under 18s, all the way up until under, every single uh, age group, yeah, under 21. Unbelievable. And it's the last <laughs> box that you want to you want to exactly. tick. 16, <laughs> 70s, 80s, 90s, yeah. 20s, 21s, every single age group, but the first team. And that was that. That's that's almost why that I said I am very true to. I could have played for Jamaica way before this if I wanted to. Or people might think, oh, you can't play for England now, so you joined Jamaica, but. I don't, for me, I don't think that's right because I'd be doing it for the wrong reasons and that's not what I'm here to do. I mm. want to play for England and I still think I've got a chance. So why not go for yeah. it? Because um, this article, I didn't actually write down a reference which is unlike me, but in 2019, this article said that you actually expressed that you wanted to play for Jamaica. Yeah. Now I know that's probably a journalist <laughs> or yeah. And I was thinking, hang on a minute, you've played for England all the yeah. way up until the under 21s. Yeah. And I was going to go like, been a traitor now to us or what yeah no <laughs> the, 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 that, that whole scenario was quite funny when it came out because it it even like you know people have said to me is that it doesn't make any sense because why would i ask them to play for jamaica like you said i've just already I paid for all the english age groups so i was only what 20 must have been 24 25 maybe so why would i give up that opportunity at 24 when i've still got so many years ahead of me in my career I'm still playing in the Premier League why would I give that up to play for Jamaica it doesn't make any sense you know they messaged me and they said oh we want to play. I said listen not the right time you know if you want to get in, um, in contact with my agent or whatever then just do it that way so then I don't know if they, they misconstrued that as being I'm asking them to if I can play I don't, I don't know but anyway it was just one of those things where yeah, a bit blown out of proportion. But at the end of the day, I told them, I explained to them the situation and I stuck to my guns and that's that. And I said, I've not really heard anything back since. So I think that's uh, dead in the water. <laughs> um, on the note of international yeah. playing, we're obviously just started the World Cup in uh, Qatar. England played yesterday and won 6-2. Yeah. I had to hes hesitate there because I didn't actually watch the game. I was <laughs> no. still working. But... Still working, yeah. <laughs> it's weird, wasn't it, at the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it was. It was. Um, and no, not disrespect, being disrespectful to who they were playing, but I just, I was just like, well, I don't know. In my mind, it wasn't a, bit, a big deal game. Yeah. I, I know I'm probably going to get ridiculed for that and I should support all that. But I was just like, look, it's at the start. I've got work to do. I'm going to yeah, watch it course, when we yeah. get a little bit further down. Yeah. Um, your interpretation of the team right now yeah. and the individuals in there and the actual culture in that England squad, yeah. do you think we actually honestly got a proper chance of getting anywhere near being winners of the World Cup? 100%. I, I said it from the start to some, you know, some friends and family that I think, I think if we don't win a World Cup within the next two I'd say two to three World Cups, I would be severely disappointed just purely because of the, the, the talent that we've got, the players we've got, the, the culture that they've created there. Because I said there is a clear difference in culture between, you know, what you'd call golden generation. So the Skulls, the Beckhams, the Ferdinands, Terrys, Gerrards, Lampards, that era, they should really have done a lot better than they did. But mm. it, I said numerous times that they talk about it and they, they go back and they say about, you know, little things like they didn't need to get the, you know, the Chelsea lads sat there, the Man United lads sat there and they always talk about that they should have done better. But the culture that they've got now is brought all together. Um, and it's, I said, I, I've not obviously been in that first team environment, but I was lucky enough to have Gareth and Steve um, in the 21s um, for a couple of camps before they did go to the first, the, the first team. Um, and they said they were the same then, you know, they created a really nice culture. The 21s was a good, place to be you wanted to go to the camps um, mm. and I think that's a big thing you want to go there pa players want to go and play for England it's a good experience um, they enjoy it it's not boring like it might have been under previous regimes um, and I said the talent that they've got in the squad is you know compared to 
around the world is just as good. You know, the, you've got the Bellinghams, you've got Saka, you've got Sterling, Kane. I mean, it's Trippier. I mean, you know, people talk about Kieran Trippier. He's what people, in some people's minds, you've got Walker, Reese James, Trippier. He's third, you know, people would say he's third choice right back, but he's unbelievable. Mm. Like he's absolutely unbelievable as a leader. He, he's fantastic defensively. He's fantastic going forwards. Um, so I said, they've, they've got so much ability in that squad. And especially with the Euros coming so close, I think they've got the mentality that I think the previous generation didn't have you know, as a group, not individuals. Um, yeah. They've got to semi-finals in the last World Cup. They've got to the final in the Euros. So I said, they've got that winning mentality and they've got that ability to to get through certain stages of difficult moments. And especially for a squad and a team, that's massive. So I really think this year, or oh, this World Cup could be uh, special for them. Who do you reckon's the strongest individual in that team? Mentally, physically? All round. All round. It's a really, it's a tough, it's a tough one. Um, I can, only, I can't speak really because I don't know a lot of them personally, or you know what they've been through off the pitch, or you know. But I, speaking from the lads that I do know quite well, um, you know, Callum Wilson, for instance, um, getting the assist yesterday, obviously getting the call up to go to the World Cup squad. You know what he's been through throughout his football career. Um, it's a full credit to himself um, in terms of him getting there and having the ability to get there because there's a lot of injury issues. You know, I did a rehab with him um, last year. I had my knee, he had his Achilles and calf. Um, and he's got such a strong mentality to be able to bounce back from those injuries and still play at the highest level that he's playing at now and the level that he is. Um, so for me, mentally, him, he's got the drive, the determination to be able to still still be there at 30 he's had it said two ACLs he's had mm. calves hamstrings and yet he's still there and I think that, that takes a lot I said I've had a few injuries I know what it's like it can take a lot out of you mentally and physically to get back from them every time but he's had three or four five serious ones that are, you know five six months and more so to do that to put his body through that mentally go through that and to still get there is a credit to him who do you think the weakest is in the team oh weakest do you know what I, I, I don't think there, there, there can be a weakest because I think that to get to that level of performance and level of ability I don't think you can be weak I really don't because if you know you look at the players that you get scrutinised so much mm. you know Harry Maguire Luke Shaw at times when he was at United with Mourinho um, everyone gets scrutinised so to be able to play at that level under that scrutiny and still perform and still perform for your clubs you know even the things that you know Grealish for example you know when he was at Aston Villa yes he got publicity but since he moved to City it's just skyrocketed so you know to deal with that to deal with being a hundred million pound player you can't be weak mentally mm. it's impossible mm. you just crumble you wouldn't be able to deal with it all yeah. so you have to be mentally strong I think to be at that level and to be in that stage so I don't think anyone really can afford to be weak. Yeah. Um, they probably, I said, there probably been moments where they've been down for sure, or they've been sitting there thinking, you know, I could, I'm getting hammered here, or you know, I'm I'm not playing well, and I don't know what to do, and I can't shake it off, or whatever it is. But they've always bounced back, yeah. and that's a credit to them, and that's the reason why they're at the elite level and why they're at that pinnacle of football. Yeah, we did take ten past it. Yeah. yeah, sorry, ten. He he just nodded me at oh. ten two, so he's just probably oh. yeah just ahead. There are a few more things I want to ask you. No um, on that note of England, do you ever look at anyone in that team and think, like you got the belief that yeah. you're going to become an England player and yeah. I truly believe eventually you will get there because you've got this like razor sharp determination and vision. But do you ever look at the squad right now and think, I'm better than that person. I, I reckon I should be in, in their position. Not really, no, because I'm a firm believer in that whatever's meant to happen ha should is going to happen, whether you like it or not. Um, everything happens for a reason. Um, same thing at Newcastle. Um, I played, I thought I did okay. I thought I did well um, up until the new manager come in. New manager comes in. Um, I didn't play the first couple of games when he came in, even though the game before... Um, 
the game that he watched before he um, became manager, I scored in and actually probably played my best game of the season in, uh, draw a 1-1 against Brighton. And then the next game, I didn't play. So I was thinking, well, I haven't done, you know, wow, like, how's that happen? Uh, I didn't play the first couple, then I played a couple and then, you know, I start to get in the team. Then I got the injury, MCL. Didn't play the rest of the season. Newcastle, phew, done. Yeah. So how do you go from playing the first t or 10 games in a row under the new manager, there's I probably played, there's probably availability to play five, maybe five games or six games. And I started two, came on sub two. So maybe I played three quarters of the games under him. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't as if I wasn't playing at all and he didn't fancy me at all. And then I played Liverpool away, I think it was Man City at home. And then I walked off at Man City at home after 65 minutes, I think it was. And I never in my million years thought that was the last game I'd ever play for Newcastle or the, or the last game that I would play for Newcastle in that situation. And I was just walking off thinking, oh, you know, I'll be back after, you know, after the next game or the game after that. And then literally, yeah, scanned my knee, felt yeah. real pain on it. Bang, yeah, yeah. M MCL reconstruction, four and a half month injury, have it done think I'm still going to be in the squad. Obviously then they say, listen, you're going to be out until May. So we're going to have to take you out of the 25 man squad, which I fully accepted and realized, you know, said, well, it makes sense if I'm not going to contribute. But then after that I said, football moves so quick. So you've gone from playing for Newcastle in that sense, actually doing okay, feeling in a good position, new managers come in, he's improving a lot of the lads. I'm watching it, I'm thinking, yeah, I can definitely improve. So then phew, gone. Yeah. So football changes like that. So for me, at any given moment, especially the English squads, you deserve to be there at the end of the day. You're playing, whether you've done, people, a lot of people talk about this and, oh, so-and-so shouldn't be in the squad or Maguire's not played, so he shouldn't be in the squad or whatever it is, whatever player it is. But the fact is, is that it's almost like, not a club manager, but it's similar in the terms of that Harry Maguire, for example, let's use him as an example in terms of people saying he shouldn't be in the squad. He's never let England down. He got England to a semi-final and he got England to a Euro final. And he got player, I think he was in the team of the tournament. Don't quote me, but I think he's in the team of the tournament for Euros. Now, the manager obviously trusts you playing for England. I'm not talking about him playing for United, it's all about him playing for England. So the manager trusts you in that environment. So it's obvious that the manager is going to bring you or select you because he trusts you. So it's like when you go to your club, a new manager comes in, you know, manager will go out, you know, I, I can count on that player to do X, Y, and Z or to do a job. So he's going to pick him. Simple as that. You know, another manager might come in and go, I don't like that player. So a good one was at Newcastle, we had Fabian Shah, top player, Swiss international center half, unbelievable player on the ball, defensively very good. But the manager before Eddie Howe didn't play him, didn't play. I think loads of games didn't play him, was on the bench, wasn't interested. Eddie Howe comes in, everyone's going, oh, what a play. After 10 games, he's thinking, wow, Fabian Shah is unbelievable. No, he was always unbelievable. It's just that the manager before didn't believe in him. And that happens with loads of players where, you know, one manager likes you, another manager doesn't. Gives you the confidence, one manager doesn't, one manager does. You can be a different player. Mm. So you see that with so many clubs, you think, well, you know, I'm trying to think of, the, of a good one. So under Unai Emery now, compared to Gerard, the same players. It's three weeks difference. That's all there is, was between managers. Yet under Gerard, they couldn't string five passes. And that's not Gerard's, you know, I'm not saying that that's Gerard's fault. What I'm just saying is that sometimes in football, the way that it works is that different people can get different things out of certain squads. Yeah, I understand that. I'm very well, we've only got a few more minutes, but I do want to yeah. ask you this subject in yeah. the round. Someone who's been in the media recently, maybe not for always the best reasons, but he's probably the, or certainly the top two or three individuals in the world, which is deemed as being the GOAT, you know? Yeah. Ronaldo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, his outburst yeah. on Piers Morgan, yeah? yeah. Say outburst, not outburst, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long interview. Old, yeah, interview, yeah, yeah. and there's been some other remarks he's made. Um, I know you're not Ronaldo, no. yeah. So I'm not yeah. asking you to put yourself it, but you are a Premiership footballer. You know, you yeah. are an elite footballer. Yeah. You are someone that probably has played alongside people like this before. Yeah. Um, 
Is he poisonous for, for the Premiership? Is he poisonous for Man United? Do you think it's right how he's acted or do you think he's well in his right? He should be doing that. Uh, it's a tough one really because I, I can see from both sides. I can see from the club side and I can also see from Ronaldo's side. The problem is, is that Ronaldo's used to elite, elite level. Everything's been, if you think about his career from when he was at Man United to Real Madrid to Juventus, he's only seen the best. And I mean the best of like every league that he's played in. He, he's only seen the best facilities, the best people that he's worked with, the best coaches, the best uh, facilities, the best mentality. Every single thing has been the best. Yeah. So if you think about that over a span of you know, 15 years, I've only seen the best. He's then come from that to where United is now, which is not the best. It's nowhere near City, Liverpool, even Chelsea. You know, Arsenal, I think, are, are ahead in terms of their process. So it's not even in the top four clubs, really, in England. Mm -hmm. So, and in terms of facility-wise, I mean, you mentioned about the jacuzzi and all that stuff. Really, that's, for me, that's secondary because a player of, or a person of his magnitude would have facilities at his home anyway, really. So a jacuzzi not being done doesn't make much difference, does it? But I can see from his perspective, in terms of the mentality, maybe, in terms of where the ambition, where is it in terms of where they want to go? Do they want to be where Man City are? How do they get there? What's the strategy? What's the structure of it? So I can see from that side of him, he's probably hard for him to swallow because he's so much used to that elite, elite, elite level that he's come to United now. He's obviously won his career down, so he's not the same player, obviously, but he's still sitting there and in his mind, in his mentality, that's what he's used to. So he's thinking, well, you know, what am I doing? And then obviously he wanted, you know, whatever it was, he wanted to leave. He didn't want to leave. The club's pushing him out. No one's going to know that really, apart from the club and him. But for me, when you start talking about the club in that way, obviously with his fan base and, you know, the 500 million Instagram followers, whatever he's got, he's the most followed in the world almost. When you start saying that against a club that obviously pays you, it's a difficult situation to be in mm. so from the club's perspective i can clearly see because he's an icon of the club legend of the football club and for him to speak out about the football club like that is very damaging so i can see it from both sides it's a really difficult one but it's, it's clearly for me in my head there's a clearly a motivation from him to do it in terms of positioning himself in the way that suits him best because i think if he if there was no other option or for him personally, he had to stay at United. He wouldn't do that interview. So for me, he's done it to position himself to get a, hit Ronaldo himself the best position possible. Agreed. Uh, Ronaldo, Messi, who's a better player? For me, I've always said Ronaldo. Always. Who's and that's best? not because I, I said I, I love Messi as well in terms of player. But for me, everyone talks about who's the better player. Technically, in terms of natural ability, Messi's better, clearly, because he's... God given talent, but Ronaldo is manufactured. And the thing is, the big thing for me of why I think Ronaldo is overall better is because, not because of the Ballon d'Ors, not because of his statistics, not because of goals, assists, all that stuff. I just mean purely, he's come to England, he's done it in England. He's gone to Spain, he's done it in Spain. He's won five Champions Leagues, he, or five or six maybe, I can't remember the, the stats. Um, He's gone to Italy. He's won, won everything in Italy. He's done it in three leagues. It's, impo it's impossible to compare, to say that. He's also won the Euros with Portugal. I know Messi won the, um, what was it? The, um, the, yeah. the, the, the Spanish, the, yeah. the South American equivalent. Yeah. Um, I understand that. But for me, he's done it in three leagues. In, you can't compare that. Yes, okay, Messi's a genius, we know that. He's at Barcelona pretty much his whole career. Yes, he's gone to PSG, but with all due respect, PSG in France, I don't think France are even ranked in the top five leagues anymore, maybe. Mm -hmm. They might have gone dropped out of the top five leagues in the world. So it's not, it's not the same. Mm. So, you know, I think if Ronaldo went to PSG, it would be nailed on to get a title. So he's done it in three leagues, and that's just, for me... I think that shows the level of ability that you've done it in more than one league. Who's the best player you, you've played against? Um, well, funny enough, I played against Ronaldo 
last year. He was very good, but difficult to say because he's he's not the same player as he once was. You can see the you can see it's still in him, but he can't physically do the same things that he used to because he's not of the you know his body as much as he keeps his body ticking over and it's perfect and he you know recovers well. It's impossible when you're 37 to do the same things you did at 24. I don't care who you are, you're not going to be a machine that much of a machine. He's still fit, he still runs quick, etc. But he's not the same. Um, Probably between David Silver and Kevin De Bruyne. And who's the best player you've played with? Oh, best player I've played with. <sighs> That's a really tough one. Really tough one. You know, when Alexis Sanchez was at Arsenal, mm. he was pff, something I've never seen before. Especially growing up as a kid, he was absolutely... I mean, obviously United is a different story, but when he was at Arsenal, he was absolutely electric and I've never I've never seen it was the first player that I saw that really epitomised work rate and I'll never forget it we we were in um, we played Borussia Dortmund I think it was it was it Dortmund or it was it was I can't remember it was a German team I think it was Dortmund Champions League we played them we won 1-0 I think Aaron Ramsey scored I remember every game loads of games I remember everything um, Aaron Ramsey scored he played the full 90 minutes he came back. We flew back, obviously, during the night. Got back in at 5 a.m. Then we were due back at training for midday for a recovery session or whatever it was. And I remember coming in at 11 because I couldn't really sleep and I lived close by anyway. I drove in. I remember it was 11. It was probably half 11. And I walked through the into the academy change rooms. And as you walk through the gyms on your right, or it wasn't your right, I remember looking thing, hearing like a treadmill, like a proper, you know, like treadmill was... Going, going fast and I was thinking must be someone from rehab or whatever and I've looked in and it's Sanchez at 11 o'clock and he just got back probably home half five six o'clock and he just played 90 minutes the night before and he's running on the treadmill like 17 18 kilometers an hour dripping in sweat and you know when you sit there and think like what are you doing <laughs> and then all the staff used to go what like get off like what and he just he wasn't interested he just used to honestly I've never seen a player like it yeah. It might be why he's, you know, when he went to United, injuries crept in and as he got older. But when he was at Arsenal, he was like, I've never seen a machine like it. Yeah. He used to, if you, you know, they used to take the balls off him. They say, no, you can't train today. You have to rest. He's like, no rest, no rest. Yeah. I train. And he was like the epitom epitomized, like, work, 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 work. And it was his mentality. I don't know whether it's a South American mentality. They just built differently. They just hungry. Hun yeah. yeah. He was desperate to play. You know, he was happy to play, whether it was training, little five asides, rondos, you know, head tennis. He was just, I've never seen a player like it. So probably Sanchez, just for that. Here's my last question, okay? Yeah. Not football related. When I first came up with my first brand, my first company when I was 24, 25 years of age. Yeah. I was managing basically a lot of salespeople, which were predominantly 90% men. Like, yeah. Imagine a young football premiership club. I'm trying to manage these people and I come up with a bit of a mantra, okay? Yeah. And it goes like this. Be happy, never content. Yeah. Now I've got my own interpretation of what that means, but if I was to ask you, professional footballer, yeah. Isaac Hayden, what does be happy, never content mean to you? I think for me, it's just, it's being, being happy, not being comfortable. That's what I'd say. Um, and that's probably something that I live by all the time is that, don't get wrong, I'm, all, I'm happy. I've got a lovely family, a uh, lovely support network. Um, but I think mentality wise, I always try to get better. I always try to improve. I always want more, not necessarily financially, but more as in, achievements and self-worth um and i feel that's really important um obviously every poem's different everyone's got different goals but i think for me is it's adding value to something would mean more to me than money and maybe that's because i said i feel comfortable in terms of what i earn and what i have earned and invested that i feel comfortable in terms of what i've got you know i'm not sitting here saying to you you know i need to have a bugatti or i want to have this i've had every flash car you can think of lambo ferrari whatever i've already i've been i've always been there seen it done it so i'm all about adding value and you know being part of something which means more to a wider range of people not just you know i can say that i've got a new watch today or i mm. you know i earned 
50 grand so I'm going to go and buy this it's more you know I've added value to this organization and we've achieved this that's great right. response wicked episode I really enjoyed it thank you Top very man. much for your time you and we're Pleasure. staying stay in communication yes. and uh, subscribe comment do all that great stuff and thank you very much and be happy never content cheers top man